Good morning, and welcome to Grand Rounds. We're um, going to go ahead and start on time because we're broadcasting today. Today's Grand Rounds is going to be on the Get Well Network. Our speaker today is uh, Michael O'Neill, who is the founder and the CEO of the Get Well Network, and also Zach Widener, and he is the Carillion Interaction Patient Care Manager. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having us today. I was driving down here last night from uh, Washington D.C. to your beautiful city. Very dark with lots of trucks, so I was taking it very slowly to make sure that I was arriving here safely. But um, it's really kind of neat. I, I, I'm sure you guys wake up. I hope you wake up this way every day. Uh, you will touch uh, patients and families today that are going through truly a uh, like the funny moment. So while for you it's probably the everyday amazingness of what you all do, uh, for them uh, that one particular touch uh, could not be more poignant. And so, like, it's a thrill to have a chance to uh, talk to you today. And hopefully we'll do three things over a relatively efficient amount of time. Um, and uh, one of the couple things. One, just want to share uh, the story from the voice uh, of a patient. Uh, two, I do want to um, uh, talk a little bit about a, a model called interactive care. That's something that um, we've been researching and writing about uh, for the last several years. Just something for you to consider as you begin to uh, and continue to kind of do uh, your work. And then uh, three, um, do want to. Uh, my organization is at the forefront of a lot of research happening in patient and family engagement and the potential impact uh, of that work um, on outcomes. And wanted to share with you guys um, some things happening along those fronts as well. Um, so that's kind of the three, the three things that we thought we would do today. Um, but I'll start kind of with this. Um, uh, I was being asked earlier, um, so what is your background in medicine? And so I guess um, in some cases uh, you choose something to do. In other cases, things choose you. And so uh, I actually was at Georgetown University about 15 years ago studying for a, a JD MBA and was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, during my graduate school. And so I was sitting in a classroom much like this, um, buckling over a lot for about three or four months and a lot of pain, a lot of pain in my lower back. Um, and so I had gone to the student clinic um, literally seven times. And the initial diagnosis was, hey, you're uh, 28 now, not 21. So all these flag football and basketball leagues you're playing and are wreaking havoc on your lower back, you probably have a, a bulging disc. So I did a bunch of MRI stuff and nothing came out. And then the pain began to spread from my lower back into my abdomen. And so I was now back, I remember his name, uh, Dr. Marsh, who's a young physician. I'm a resident of Georgetown, so I now gone back to the student clinic. The poor guy had to see all his crazy students every day. So anyway, I went back and I was saying, he said, hey, listen, um, why are you carrying a law school book? I thought you were getting an MBA. I said, oh, yeah, well, I'm actually doing uh, both. I said, oh, well, listen, you have what we call a law school ulcer. We see about eight of your classmates every semester. You just need to relax. Things are actually going to be fine. And so I said, yeah, something just doesn't feel right. So I was on trial sec, and the pain continued to spread. I began to sweat a lot at night, waking up in just a pool of sweat in my bed. And finally, one day, went into the ER at Georgetown and let, tell, tell, told them the story. And said, listen, I need somebody to not press outside of me. Someone's got to figure out something going on. The fire is inside, if you will. And so um, they knocked me out, um, did an EGD. And I woke up to a site I will never forget. So I had been engaged for three months to a little 102-pound uh, Armenian ball of fire named Wendy Eskandarian, who's my wife today. Um, and so every night for the past three months, I'd get home from grad school, and she would come home from work clutching her wedding magazine and wanted to talk about all this incessant things around flowers and table settings and things that I would pretend that I wanted to actually talk about. Anyway, I wake up uh, from the EGD, and I look over to my bed tray, and there was a four-color photograph you all are too young, but back in the day and when I was diagnosed in 99, they actually would spit out these, like, Polaroid pictures out of the, out of the CT scan, if you will. And, um, and so I saw this picture, this gross-looking thing on the inside of my stomach. I didn't know what it was. And I looked to my right, and here's Wendy clutching the magazines, but, like, tears showing down her face. And I'm kind of like, oh, shit, it's going to be a really bad next 30 minutes. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, sure enough, um, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis had told me, listen, um, uh, we've got some bad news. It is a tumor in your stomach. Uh, we believe it's stomach cancer. So I've, it's a Tuesday. I've already had you scheduled on Thursday to get surgery at GW with a friend of mine, Dr. Stephen Evans. He's going to cut your entire stomach out, 
he's going to connect your small intestine to your large intestine. And if it works out, you'll have a relatively normal life. You've got to eat really small meals. And so uh, with a boat full of hysteria, uh, we began to make 100 calls to anybody who would possibly see us or listen to say, um, this is what we've just heard. Uh, we are really, really anxious. And we're hoping that um, somebody else might tell us something different. And so within uh, 24 hours, we were uh, actually up in Baltimore. And, um, and uh, within about 36 hours, we're in surgery, having laparoscopy surgery to kind of take, to check out what the tumor really was, to kind of get deeper into the pathology of it all. Um, and it turns out after nine days of sitting in a hospital way pathology come back, it took that long back then, um, I was diagnosed with non Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I went through uh, four cycles of CHOP chemotherapy to treat my cancer. And the way it was described to me then was, hey, other than your cancer, you're pretty healthy. So with CHOP chemotherapy, we try to kill all the cells, and we hope the good ones grow back and the bad ones stay away. Um, and so uh, I am one of these... Uh, members of the cancer club who have had an uh, unbelievably wonderful um, medical outcome and are so grateful to the oncologist and the team that treated myself and my family during that time. From a patient and family standpoint, I will tell you my experience was far uh, less than wonderful. Um, I never felt so out of control at a time in my life I needed to be in the most control. Um, at the time when I actually was being asked to make the most important decisions uh, of my life, I felt like um, uh, no one seemed to have the time or inclination to helped me be a key part of the decision-making process. And so I was frantically searching um, during this time to get hands on anything I could. And the craziest thing at Hopkins was the following. Um, I was there for nine days waiting for my, for my diagnosis to come back. And um, every morning you want your doctor to come in exactly at 9 o'clock because when he or she comes in, it's like the one piece of here comes the magician that I actually can listen to and guide me through this experience. But as you guys probably know, because you're in this field, um, it's never exactly 9 o'clock because you have lots of other things kind of going on. So while I wanted to be consistent as a patient, um, I never really know. Sometimes by the time you come in, I'm sleeping. I don't even get to see you. And it gets me so anxious because I actually haven't had my one precious touch with you on that particular morning. You know, so the only thing consistent when I was in Baltimore at Hopkins was the following. This is the craziest thing. Every morning, exactly at 8.45, a young guy would come in my room, he had headphones on, he'd kind of be dancing to his music, and he would ask me for eight bucks to the television on. And if I didn't have the cash, he actually would take a metal key, he would stand on a chair, he'd turn it off. Now, on the third day, I said to him, listen, um, i got to be honest with you, man, like, I, I'm thinking that um, I might have cancer, and I'm trying to figure out like, um, what this all might be about. So is there any kind of like, education? What can I get my hands on? He said, oh, well, there's an education channel, channel 12. And so I took this thing, and I had to go all the way up around all the channels. And by the time I got back around the 12, I, I kid you not, I looked at the screen, and it's a breastfeeding video. I'm like, what is going, like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. But anyway, so, so long story short, got through my chemotherapy, went back to Georgetown for my last year of grad school with a bald head and about 10 pounds lighter, and began to research and write around a concept called interactive patient care. That, quite frankly, is a lot more important than the company I run today called Get Well Network. And the concept is something that is easy to say but very hard to do and actually takes us working in partnership to make happen. And the concept says we can find a way to take the mission statement off the poster in Nancy Agee's office, which undoubtedly says we are committed to patient and family-centered care. If we can find a way to take the mission statement off the poster on the wall and bring it to the point of care, we will have a transformative impact and difference on the service, on the quality, and the outcomes of care for our patients. And so we have been on a 15-year journey to find physicians and nurses and administrative leaders who in many cases have the courage and fortitude to take this notion and systematically put it into the way to deliver care. Because if every patient, every family, every time felt empowered, informed, involved, and collaborative in the care process, we fundamentally believe that the care actually would get better. And so this has become um, the life work that we actually do every single day. Um, so we sit here um, in my world as a patient and we marvel um, at your incredibly skilled and knowledgeable hands. And then we also pine for an opportunity to participate alongside of you in the care for our children or for ourselves or for our parents or what have you. And so I wanted to share a little bit of that um, kind of perspective. So the work that we do is, I guess, in many ways, 
profoundly personal and profoundly um, patient family centered. Make sense? I want to kind of start with that this morning. Now, um, interestingly enough, uh, you guys probably know this, um, we've kind of conditioned people in healthcare um, to not be active participants. Um, and uh, what the premise of the research is, is, uh, hey, if we, if we invite people in, if we don't get annoyed that they show up with a stack of stuff they printed off of Google, if we actually invite them in to being a part of this, um, might we actually um, deliver better care? That meets them where they are, that's more personalized, that can have a bigger impact, that may help them decide on the treatment plan that's best for them based on kind of where they are in their life journey, maybe not their health journey. That's kind of how we think about this. Um, and I thought this was kind of funny. So before I make my decision, I'd like to ask for your opinion. Mm -hmm. it's, supposed to, it's supposed to make you feel engaged. And you actually plan to listen to us? Well, I'm hoping it will look that way on the outside. So th this is what I'm hoping we can at least begin to think we might have awareness on, because awareness alone um, will allow us to begin to uh, authentically invite uh, people in because uh, I think the care gets richer. That's what we're researching, okay? So we've been off on a bunch of research. We had um, uh, Robert Wood Johnson sponsored a big summit that we actually held um, uh, up in D.C. And we actually had uh, uh, about 50 people there. There were physicians and nurse leaders and patients and patient advocates uh, from all over the country who actually came together and we were actually listening to them um, and, uh, and we did a big uh, research review. So I have to admit, there are, there are 486 research articles that our research team actually read and summarized and collapsed. I did not read all of them, um, a few of the highlights, but here's kind of what it's saying. So here's what patients actually are telling us through the research they actually want. Um, makes sense, care is individualized. Care is mutually determined. Is the patient and family truly part of the decision on what care is going to be given, mutually determined. Um, integration between caregivers. As patients and families, a lot of times we hear something from our physician. Um, the nurse kind of rolls his or her eyes at the physician they're actually working with when they actually leave. And then the care manager says something different. I'm kind of like, what? I think I might have heard two different things. So we actually want care that actually is truly coordinated. Truly that the team is working together so that what I'm getting is, wow, they're all on the same page. It gives me so much confidence that my physician and my nurse and my social worker and the care manager is all telling me the same exact thing. It's so clear they're talking about me, that they actually know who I am. They know that I actually can't get my kid to his rehab appointments next week because I'm actually going to be out of town for a business trip. So they've actually helped me figure out how I'm going to make sure I get the care action. So it's a really important kind of thing that we're hearing from patients. Um, we really want to understand and see that everyone's on the same page really importantly. Just kind of what the research is saying. And I promise you, it's not just my opinion. So um, I will not bore you to tears, but there's just there's the body of work around patient and family engagement from a medical standpoint is frankly awesome these days. For many, many years, patient and family engagement in medicine has been an art form, not a lot of science. And so we're spending a lot of time, frankly, trying to boost the science of patient and family engagement to make sure there's efficacy in if we do engage patients and families differently in their care, um, what actually works and what doesn't. When should we actually educate the patient and family on their kid's asthma? When are they most apt to understand what it means to take control of their own health journey when they actually leave our skilled hands? How many times should we remind them? When should we actually call them? How many times should we actually educate them on the same information about their meds? Will they understand it at discharge, or do they have no idea what we're saying, even though they're telling us they're not going to actually do? So we're doing a lot of research to kind of figure out, from a human standpoint, how can I most effectively be engaged in my care so that I can be a better patient for you and for myself? And the system has been set up historically to be very unidirectional, with me as... Um, petrified, scared patient nodding, and then leaving your skilled hands and having no idea how to take good care of myself. So we're trying to figure out in the research um, what we can do 
from a provider standpoint to set up skills, systems, processes, technologies, all in one, to make sure, again, that every patient every time has a better chance of being a better patient. Because if our jobs are to say, hey, I just met you, how can I rapidly build you as a great patient with a great system around you? It's not going to be me. I have 50 other things you're going to go do the minute I actually leave your room. So we can kind of find a way to build great patients quickly. We can really have a change. So lots and lots of research and evidence more and more every day that's linking engagement to better outcomes. And so the work we're doing is a lot part of that work. Um, and I want to just give you a premise before we talk about this model to share with you. So when we think about, number one, like um, healthcare has been delivered forever with a couple of really important pieces of data that you all have been trained so well to um, read, understand, and make decisions on. And that data is typically clinical data. And on the business side, it's claims data from insurance companies, but clinical data. And our premise is that we're researching this. If we added a third leg to the data stool, if we actually added patient voice data to the clinical equation in a more systematic, consistent, actionable, real-time way for you, might you actually give a different intervention if this other piece of data was involved? And so we are trying to figure out all the time, taking 15 years and we'll take 50 more. Um, this is, as you guys know, just with your work, this is life where it's not something you solve and it's all of a sudden fixed. It's really about how do we think about this differently. So we're trying to figure out if we can actually add patient voice data in a more systematic fashion so that it doesn't rely on you having a good day, you know, or a patient having a good day, but instead if the system was set up where we actually had this kind of data, I don't understand my meds. I can only afford my next two refills. I can't afford medications after September. I don't even have a ride to get to my rehab. I've heard three different things from three different physicians, and I have no idea what the right direction is. If we actually added, or, hey, not really good with this technology stuff, so you've given me this patient portal online, I have no idea if you're going to log in. Or the opposite. Hey, I live my whole life on this thing. Don't give me any more paper. Just put it on here, I, I'll pay attention to it. If we knew these things, you know, and we put that into the data, might we get different interventions? So we're trying to figure out all the time, like, um, how this might impact us. And it's been a really interesting journey around that. Now, at this summit, um, that the LWJ folks supported, um, it's pretty amazing. So we had all these people in. And um, here's kind of what it is that the patients were actually telling us. I just wanted to share this with you. I thought it was really kind of neat. So um, I won't go through them all, but I thought a couple of them were kind of interesting. So one, um, this is kind of poignant. So the patients were saying to us, uh, we, really, uh, really, we really don't want um, the illusion of certainty. We actually want to figure it out together. So it's okay that um, I got something weird happening in my blood and you don't know exactly what it is yet. I kind of don't want the illusion of you claiming or you're looking in your eyes thinking that everything is I know this, I got this, I'm a doctor. More like, hey, we'll figure this out together. It might take, might, might take some time, and it's going to be unsettling, but we're with you together on this, and we need your participation in it. It's kind of interesting. Um, this old spectator, the team member, hope these aren't too cliche, but these like the, the direct phrase coming out of these patients really kind of a poignant time for us as we were kind of sitting there for two days in this workshop. This notion of hierarchy versus equal partners, and this is like, it becomes so cliche, this is a fundamental change in the way we might think about delivering medicine. Um, you all are up on high. You're at the pinnacle of knowledge uh, in your field. And as patients, we have been conditioned forever to uh, look up at you, to actually be a little bit afraid of you. And so you wouldn't believe the impact of the nuances of your body language and your words on my ability to either shut down or to open up around how the best care might be given. And so the patients are telling us they want this. They don't really know how to do this either yet. They don't know how to be equal partners yet. So might we, as an industry, 
nurses, physicians, care, might we actually play a role in starting to help build patient skills around empowerment? How might we help them actually be more empowered as we actually walk forward? So we're trying to figure this stuff out as well. So I thought we'd share, he might turn that on? I thought we'd share this perspective from a 15-year-old in her experience. So the doctors don't let you sleep at all. Like, if you think you're going to get sleep, then you're crazy. Because they come in at 6 in the morning, and they don't all come together. There's a med student first, most of the time, and then there's another one, and then there's another one, and they're a resident, and then there's the actual doctor, who's the actual important one. And then my other doctor, my rheumatologist, he comes in at, at noon, like a normal person on his lunch break, and he actually cares about me, so he lets me sleep. And then the other ones are just like, oh, no, I don't care. Like, do you need sleep to heal? No, I don't think so. Like, that's crazy. Like, who needs sleep? That's not important. So they come in at whatever time, at 6 in the morning, and I am here, and I, I need sleep. I need to be awake. I need to be happy. And I've tried to tell them that I get, I give better answers, and I will talk to you more. I will participate more if I'm not laying in bed like, what did you say to me? Are you talking to me? I'm asleep. I'm sorry. Yeah, so th that's not going to work if you're not getting engaged and talking to you. And that's how people work together and do things because they talk. And if they don't talk, then it's bad. It's just not good. It's not good. And it's just, it really annoys me too when they ignore you and they try to talk to your parents. Like, I am 15 years old. I know that's not that old, but I, I, at least I should have some say in what I want being done to me. Like, I am the patient, and I need to be heard. Like, I am the patient. It's going to end up happening to me anyway. So if you try to leave the room to protect me from whatever, it doesn't work. I would like to hear what you're about to do to me. If you're about to poke me with a freaking needle, tell me. If you're about to cut off my arm, tell me. I need, I need to know. So I have two uh, girls at home, uh, one is 13 and one is 11, and uh, if my 13-year-old was in the hospital, that actually would be her. So when I saw it, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's Kala. So, um, but, but, but um, just an important uh, perspective on that. So I promise the last of the uh, sad stories, I think an important one contextually for us, and we think about delivering care. So uh, seven years after my cancer journey, my wife and I had twin babies, uh, Ava and Macy. And we lost my little Macy after 19 days to a diaphragmatic hernia. So she was born at the Nova Fairfax, uh, airlifted down to children, uh, was put on ECMO. Um, and I was there for 19 days in the NICU for about 20 hours a day. Uh, I might I add, standing uh, by her bay because they didn't have seats in the NICU. It was one big room about this size with about 16 bays and very sick children and hysterical parents like me. So as a parent, I would tell you the, um, the only good thing about being in the NICU as a parent is it's the reverse of when you're on the med search. Remember I told you, like, you never know when your doctor's coming? Well, in the NICU, the one cool thing is you all are always around. So, like, every 90 minutes they were around. And as a parent of a very sick baby, that was actually a really cool thing. I actually got to, I was thinking to myself, hey, I can interact with the doctors almost every hour to see how many she's well, here's the crazy thing. The team would actually walk through the three, four to five doors in the NICU. I was there for 19 days. I didn't even meet one other family because I was so stressed that I didn't talk to anybody. They actually would come in through the door, and it was two or three physicians, four, and four or five of them, residents as well, nurses, techs, whatever, probably a team of like nine people. They'd come up to each of the bays. Now, mind you, between the 89 minutes when they're there last, I'm staring at the machines and watching every turn of the ECMO machine, every single beat of the oxygen level, everything. So I'm watching this. Now, they would come to me and they'd come up to Macy's um, Bay. They'd start barking stuff each other, talking, you know, writing stuff down, like as if I weren't even there. And it's not that I ever would think um, that was going to add something miraculous to the clinical equation. I'm not a fool, but man, oh man, would it have been a different experience for me if I felt like I was participating with that team in Macy's care. Whether or not the outcome would have been different, 
I, I don't know. Probably not. You all know how sick these babies can actually be and how fragile they are. Um, but I will tell you what it taught us personally is redefined anguish and pain. What it taught me professionally was every time we were researching or thinking about patient engagement, we better think about patient and family engagement because too often the patients that we're taking care of are too young or too sick or too afraid or too medicated to be the ones effectively engaged in the care. So if we can, as a professional, find a way to help um, build empowerment, information, involvement with the folks around the patient, then they have a better chance of having a better outcome as well. And so our research work is as much around how we might find new and innovative ways to identify, introduce, and enroll caregivers in the clinical equation rapidly so we can make them better patients, help take care of each other. This is a big part of kind of our work. Um, that this is, what I, this is what I felt like. So when we want your opinion, we'll give it to you. So this is kind of sometimes what it feels like, and it's not intentional, but, uh, but, but what it, what, um, what we as patients feel like is the following. Um, uh, you all, to us, feel like um, you're overwhelmed, you have too many patients, you're rushed, my questions are annoying as hell. In particular, if I bring something in I read, forget it, you're very mad at that. That's kind of what we feel. And probably it's, it's never with malintent, is probably part of the reality of all you all have to do in a given day. And so the research that we're trying to figure out is how we might just reverse um, this equation. I thought this was classic. Imagine this mission statement that says we are committed to patient and family-centered care. And then as a patient, what I observe is that that's not what we're hearing from patients in the research that telling us actually want. So how do we do this in a way where it doesn't have extra work? How do we actually change the process fundamentally? Um, and it takes uh, us and with you all leading to how we might um, do things differently. So I just wanted to share some of this this morning, and my only intent is to um, create two things. Uh, one is just awareness, you know, of the incredible point that your touch every day has on us as patients and families. So your work is, like, freaking amazing, and, like, we're, we're pining for your involvement with us, for your connection with us. We are, like, literally, we are, like, it is the lifeblood for us in a vulnerable moment, first thing. Second thing is, is might there be a different way? And so the research we did um, uh, with, with, a, with a bunch of fellows from uh, OWJ and with a bunch of physicians and pharmacists and nurses and patients, um, the culmination of this was a published clinical model called interactive care. And the model says, what if we began to go upstream into nursing schools and medical schools and began to teach a new set of skills and a process around systematically engaging patient families in their care more effectively. And so um, the first step in this model um, is assessing a person's capacity to engage. And so we have just culminated 24 months of research um, at Carolinas in Charlotte, uh, at Kaiser out in LA, um, at Community Health in Fresno, California, and at the VA with veterans. And the research culminated in a new index called a PEI score, a Person Engagement Index. And the idea was, can we actually put a marker on every person we ever take care of to understand their capacity to engage in their own self-care? And if we knew that, if I go into Epic, and if one of the first things I saw was a PEI score, and I know, hey, this person has high health literacy, is very proactive, very low acumen for technology, don't put them on a digital pro coaching program. You're not going to be able to do it, right, or the opposite. And so just finish this research around this PEI. The idea is imagine that every patient you ever came in to see, you actually knew numerically what their capacity to engage in their own self-care was. It might change the intervention we actually give them or how we actually take care of them. And so it's something that we're actually very excited about. We envision in the next 10 years that millions of people across the world have a PEI, it's like a, like a credit score. They have a PEI score. And every, I don't care if it's Athena or Epic or Cerner, and every clinical chart in the world, 
one of the measures that you all have access to is their PEI score. And the PEI score tells me um, what is this person's capacity to engage across four different domains? Their capacity to engage in their care, their technology use, their proactiveness, and their sexual support. So it ends up being 18 question measurement, an instrument that we have put thousands of people through. It started as a 56 question instrument, which of course nobody would ever finish. And so the research over the last 24 months has been, how can we actually understand um, what things really matter to kind of get a grasp of this? And so that's kind of the work that we're actually after. It's very simple to kind of do, it looks kind of like this. And so patients on a mobile device or on a nap or whatever the thing may be can take this PEI score. And we're actually trying to begin to figure out now the linkage between person's capacity, number one, what intervention we actually may give them, and then the ultimate outcome. And so we kind of have culminated phase one of the research, and now we're actually rolling this out to what will be millions of patients in the next two years. We're kind of excited about that. And at some point, um, uh, we would love to uh, think about a certain population here that we might begin to think about, hey, can we measure their capacity to engage, and how might that change with <coughs> Just some research I want to make sure you guys are aware of. And the model, we have this crazy research team in this institute we actually launched to do all this work and like they're really smart, crazy, quantitative people. And so um, uh, doing clinical research is not easy, as you all know. This is all, always takes longer than those of us who actually just do things sometimes by instinct that you want to take. But 24 months of factor analysis and different things kind of going on, but a really exciting kind of uh, piece of research. So we really have not only an overall scale, but actually um, validated subscales as well. So it will really begin to allow us to understand a person's capacity across a couple of domains that are really kind of validated, if you will, from the data. So we're kind of excited. So you have to learn about thousands of diseases, but I only have to focus on fixing what's wrong with me. Now, which one of us do you think is, is the expert? So this is going back to the same theme. I think these things are always funny. So we have a chief nurse at our organization. She used to run the magnet organization for years. And she always inserts these crazy cartoons, anything they actually ever do. I'm like, Karen, I haven't read a cartoon in 40 years. But, she always does, but I always think these are very poignant around kind of what it is that we're, that we're thinking about. So implications of, the, of, this, of this PEI thing I want you guys to think about is uh, can we begin to customize and individualize a person's care plan based on their PEI? So I know we have an evidence-based regimen for a pediatric asthma patient or an oncology patient or what have you. But might that regimen we prescribe actually be altered based on their capacity to engage in their own care? Based on their proactiveness? Based on their literacy? Based on their technology use in their care? Might actually change the intervention, if you will, that we might prescribe. Might we actually be able to meet them kind of where they are? And the thing implications for data, we're trying to figure out with the data now, based on your PEI score and based on your clinical plan of care, um, have the outcomes actually changed? And we'll find out over the next couple of years on this whole thing, but we're really excited. The promise that we're seeing early on is that if we can understand their engagement capacity quicker and we actually can include that in your assessment on how to take care of them, um, man, it can have a big impact on their ability to kind of begin to take care of themselves. That's kind of what the nature of work is. So the second thing I wanted to make sure we did today was kind of introduce you to the thought of a new model, interactive care model, that we think ultimately we can begin to um, – teach around process and hardwire into clinical delivery? And might we actually add a new measure to the equation to give you another data point that adds that patient voice, um, not qualitatively, but quantitatively and systematically in time with evidence? Thought? Third thing, just want to give you a quick headline or headlight, uh, headlines around some really kind of neat research kind of going on. So we're in a couple of really important studies that our research institute is um, spearheading and sponsoring with our researchers as primary researchers, and some of them were actually teaming with other folks on. So um, there's a Dr. Laura Wood at Boston Children's. She is a very close partner of ours. Um, they're a big partner of ours in both the research and our technology work as well. And we're actually, um, as, as they begin to make uh, these HCAP scores, these satisfaction scores are bringing into PEDS. So we actually are researching with Dr. Wood um, might we actually get significantly more patient feedback that's accurate if we actually don't wait for a satisfaction survey to go out in the mail five weeks after we get discharged? 
And so we're actually researching with her how we might use new modalities and does it actually impact, you know, um, and skew the data and actually make the data more accurate. So we have a bunch of work with her around that, which is really kind of neat. Um, we also have a whole um, a team of actually adolescents in, uh, have been coming in to do focus groups around technology use um, in, their, um, in their care. So we're actually doing a bunch of research around that as well. So it's kind of been a neat thing. And we're actually doing some work. Are you all familiar with the Arnold Gold Foundation? Any of you physicians? So r and Gold Foundation is an is a, is a, um, organization of physicians. They actually teach empathy and care. There's a program called Tell Me More. And the whole notion is, it sounds simple, but the notion is, is if we ask a patient to tell me more about themselves, and so the initial touch with them is not um, your chief ailment, but what do you want your health for, um, might we actually have a better outcome? And so we actually are partnered with the r and Gold Foundation to actually um, run out this Tell Me More campaign to see if we actually ask patients to share more about themselves and their life journey efficiently, but in time, might actually change what actually goes on on the, on the intervention side. So kind of a neat, neat study as well. Um, I won't bore you to tears with this research, but we think it's actually really pretty cool and really pretty important. So Dr. Uh, Sarah Toomey, again, is a partner of ours. She's amazing. Um, here's kind of what's going on. So, so she did some initial research design around using tablets to do HCAPs. Uh, results and scoring of patients. Um, and what we're actually seeing is the following. Look at this, a 71% response rate versus 16%. So we think, one, we can get a tremendous amount more data around how people are perceiving the care that actually is being given to them that will help us understand more um, and in real time how we might deliver better. So lots and lots of data around more data. The second thing is, is um, it really actually uh, helps us um, frankly get more uh, dispersed data across populations as well we're seeing. Um, so, uh, so it's been a really interesting way for us to think about how to go do um, data capture differently, if you will. So we're doing a bunch of work around, around that stuff as well. And again, it just looks like this. So really elegant, simple ways to make sure patients' voice is included kind of in the feedback. So we're actually doing a bunch of research studies around those things. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier as well, uh, just this whole type 1 diabetes self-management. So we're actually trying to figure out with adolescents uh, involved in the research, um, what role do, um, what are the barriers to actually take care of themselves? What role do their friends actually play? And what role might technology play in their self-management of diabetes? And so lots of really innovative work around this whole thing as well, which has been really exciting for us. We have amazing research at Children's National in DC who are spearheading this um, in partnership with us. Um, and, and the last thing I will uh, share with you, and I'll turn it over to Zach here in a moment, um, is, uh, is I just want to um, express a profound uh, uh, gratitude. I have a lot of friends who are physicians and nurses. And um, having now kind of been in the field for 16 years, uh, I marvel at the um, breadth and depth of knowledge that you all are responsible for taking on and somehow be able to uh, pull that together in real time with an incredibly anxious person at their most vulnerable moment in their lives. And so those of us who are not in medicine directly simply marvel at your all's uh, commitment and skill and passion. I imagine this must be exhausting because um, uh, in some ways you all can't have a bad moment because for every patient it's the most important one. You know, and so I imagine the time that might feel daunting, but to us, I will tell you, um, we marvel at that. So I, I just express gratitude for that and let you know that um, just like your work, this is kind of life work for us. So we're 15 years in to what um, uh, is going to be a 50-year journey. I feel like we're still on chapter two of like a 50-chapter book. So there's lots to kind of figure out how we might do this differently um, with patients and families truly at the center, not just in our mission statement, but actually the way we deliver care every single day. That's kind of the work. And I'll share with you one quick last video story and turn it over to Zach. Once upon a time, there was a brave knight who loved to play. Until one day a dragon came along and took his breath away. He rushed to the castle, where wizards and fairies are known to make miracles happen. With potions and a magic mirror, they would help him battle the dragon. It was 
listen carefully, learn all the spells, and follow them to the letter. And as the sun came up one day, the little knight started to feel much better. And so the brave little knight was back, feeling good as new, defending our mighty fortress like little brothers are supposed to do. Thank you for listening. I'm going to share some of the research work. We totally appreciate it. And Zach's going to share things that we're actually doing here at Carillion. Good morning, everybody. Mike is always tough to follow. Thank you for that. Um, I've got just a couple minutes, so I want to kind of talk about the Carillion side of this. So I'm the interactive patient care manager for Carillion. I am the day-to-day -day get well guy here. So some of the ideas, suggestions, workflow, process, all that good stuff you can talk about. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we are doing based on the kind of larger picture that Mike just shared. Uh, patient engagement science, we talked a lot about the patient engagement index. We have actually piloted that on four units. The pilot just ended, so we're gonna go through the data and kind of see what that means for us. Let's see on the technology side, how could we incorporate that data? How useful is that data? Is the tool still too long? Is there things that we can change? We went through a, a different process. Some folks went through all the survey questions at once. Others were broken down over a sequence of days. So we're examining everything right now. We don't have a solid answer on it yet, but we'll get there. Intuitive design, so Jackson can attest. He's one of my Get Well colleagues. I harass them constantly to make this easier, to make this simpler for everybody, to make it as workable as possible. Whether you're on the beginning of your journey in healthcare, as a child, or you're at the end of your journey, it should be easy for everybody to use. So we're working very hard with their team to make that a possibility. A deep integration, so on our side, this is bi-directionally integrated. It lives in Epic, it goes across the continuum, Get Well Network, education is available to our patients on <coughs> iChart, and we're looking at ambulatory solutions. So we know sometimes it's difficult to educate folks in the inpatient setting. They might not have family there to engage with, and they might not be ready to learn. But when they do get discharged, when they do have follow-up appointments, how do we reach them then? How do we help folks be educated before they need the services at the hospital? So we're examining a lot on the ambulatory side, even our pre-surgical testing side, to get more of this education out front before folks get here. So real-time data, this is one of the beautiful parts of Gale Network. We have real-time data. I can tell you what your patients are watching, what they've engaged with, what they've started and stopped because they didn't see value in, and the areas of the system that they don't feel as useful as others. So that's something that I can provide for you if you're ever curious, if you ever want to know kind of the feel of what's going on on the unit. For now, on the nursing side, every other week, they get a report from me of how everything's going, what the numbers are, where we are, what videos are being watched, and so on. But I really would love to see providers start to engage, at least in mentioning Get Well to our patients, because uh, Mike expressed it, physicians hold a certain power over patients. I'm non-clinical, so when physicians speak, I try to listen. Not that I don't to nurses, but you take that advice a little more to heart and try to do those things. So having you engage them in this would be very effective. Uh, content with efficacy. So we have over 1,500 educational videos, and Get Well is wonderful at providing all of the evidence and the base of what it's for. It's a consistent message for our patients, so we know they're all getting the same message the same way. We create content quite regularly, and this is kind of like my 30-second sales pitch before I run out of time. I really like making Carillion content. We have a wonderful marketing resource who helps us film content. He will review it to make sure that it's on the right level, and you are the subject matter experts. We've made videos on sepsis. We have a new children's welcome video. We're getting ready to make videos for Presidex and oral prednisone to help our patients understand why they're taking those drugs. There's lots of things out there that I think we can have an impact. And if it's the message that we want to deliver, we would be more comfortable delivering it that way. Um, and knowledge when it matters. So again, we're really looking to get this across the continuum. It's not always the right time in the bed. But when they leave, they need to understand what happened. They need to understand the next steps, the signs and symptoms to look for, all that fun stuff. So being able to engage our patients while they're here and when they leave is the ultimate goal. And we're most of the way there. If we could get the ambulatory solution going, I think we would be across the continuum completely and can really have a major impact. <laughs> And research, with all that real-time data and all the touches we have with patients, this is tailor-made for research. We're actually working up a 
research project with the emergency department specifically around residents right now regarding patients' perception while they're in the bed. We can prompt a survey to ask them, did they engage me? Did they ask me how it's doing? Did they talk to me? Uh, Dr. Keel and uh, Dr. Robichaud, I believe, are leading the charge on that. We've done several QA, QI research projects around hand hygiene because we ask about hand hygiene and what are some of the barriers that patients have with that and what do they see when people don't wash in? Do they say things? So we're really using this as a tool to reach our patients and to talk with them. Uh, change management. So this is, Mike mentioned it, this is kind of a change in structure and culture. We want patients engaged. We want them to be a part of their care. So how do we collectively as an organization come together and unify that message and work towards that change to engage our patients? And how can I help you do that? Whether it's technical issues, it's too hard to use, issues with time, I'm glad to spend time with all of you to go over what Get Well is and how it works for us individually. And I do a lot of process analysis to say, maybe this would be a time. And as a non-clinician, I can tell you, as someone who's been in the bed, who's had a child in the bed before, it's scary. But there's times that you think, even though it's scary now, it would be really nice to know X, Y, Z. So I'd be glad to speak with you guys about that. And Get Well benchmarks. So we do look, how are we doing comparatively with the rest of the organizations that use Get Well Network? For the most part, we actually do really, really well. Our patients are heavily engaged. They seem to like the product, but how do we share our best practices and how do we get the best practices from other groups so that we can try them here? So that's something that on my end I work diligently at. We do a lot of referrals and we ask for referrals for things that we're looking towards. That's kind of the rub for all I have. I want to say thank you and open it up for questions for the last few minutes. Any questions in the room? All right. Back. So I was wondering, in your uh, research study, do you see a lot of variability in the PEI score in any given hospital stay for patients? Any given hospital stay? Yeah. Um, Within a hospital stay for a patient. I'm just trying to understand. You mean like on where they were in their stay or? or? Well, if the PEI score changed from like the beginning of a hospital stay to the end, yeah, did so, you see any variability? Uh, yeah, so so uh, we are seeing like uh, yes, yeah, so we are seeing relatively quick movement, you know, of some of the scores, and so we're trying to figure out through the data what's happening in the process that makes a move from one to the other, and can we then more systematically intervene to march somebody up a PEI scale between the time they get there and between the time they leave? So we're seeing some. Changes, but we don't yet know what's driving change. It's just it's just too early. Okay. But I think there's some problems in that. So uh, I'm a pediatric hospitalist, and um, as a provider, one of the things we struggle with is. So you mentioned there's a lot of videos. It's almost like there's too many videos. Um, like there, I think there's uh, like 10 or 15 asthma videos. And um, so we, a lot of times when we're ordering videos, have str struggle with which video is the best one for this patient. Um, so that's one issue that we have. I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of Get Well Network, um, but that's one issue. Yeah. Um, the other issue is, is just getting the patients to watch the videos. Yeah, um, yeah so look, on the, on, on the first one, um, here's the deal. So we have these two, uh, we have two medical librarians in the organization. We have scoured the earth, continue to, for the best patient education content in the world, and probably 30 different provide, suppliers of it, right? So our job at the company is, frankly, these 4,000 titles with 30 different vendors to cull them and to curate them into mini packs more effectively, and then get your guys skilled brains on them to say, hey, when it comes to a pediatric as a patient, here is the actual pack of these three pieces that we actually want. And frankly, we need to be better at actually calling this stuff down and making it easier and more succinct. And we're going to need your participation to help us understand, hey, for this particular diagnosis, what two pieces of education are most essential to the patient actually understanding what we're trying to do with them. Um, and so uh, we can be better at that. It's a, it's a very good point, and we're not there. It is too many. You're absolutely right. Because um, a string of nine videos for one thing is just too many. People don't watch them. That's the first thing. Hang on, sir. My intention is to try to get with 
the subject matter experts, the people in those areas, to review the videos with me. Let's make a best list. Because sometimes you might find a video where, eh, that's not really applicable here. That content doesn't mean as much to my patients. But these are our top two asthma videos. And that's actually automatically with some care plans. But when you disengage completely like that, and it's just happening on the back end, we feel like getting viewership is even harder. So look for movie nights coming, where I would like to show, you know, sections about specific procedures and get your opinion about those that would be most effective for our patients. Yeah. Uh, and your second question, your point is an important one, though, I think, the notion of is getting patient and family <clears throat> to actually watch them, if you will. So what we have found across, we're working in 400 or so organizations now, so we have lots of data to figure out what's going well, what's not, if you will, and why. So. Uh, Two things on this. One of them is um, I can't impress upon you all enough from the medical staff and the nursing staff. To the extent that as part of our admissions process, when we're meeting that patient for the first time, when we explain to them that, hey, um, as a patient at Carillion, we believe strongly in a model of engagement in your care. So your role in your care while you're here is really important to how we deliver the care. And so this is the influence that we need to be in the have from, from the very first touch. And that's kind of a looking someone in the eye and saying, hey, you and your family's involvement in your care is really important. We have a great tool here that while you're here is going to help you, frankly, be informed, have a voice, be in it. So that we ha if we don't do that well, consistently, we're not going to have the result. That's the first thing. Second thing is, is we can use technology to, frankly, um, force utilization. It sounds obnoxious, but in our world, it's like you can't watch TV because you watch this darn video. You know, like, but these things are, are choices that we need to make to say, hey, how important is the education of this family, you know, about the medications or procedures? And so we just got to figure out from a policy standpoint, like, how important we believe an educated patient and family is. And that sometimes requires us to be able to do those things. So the good news is technology can handle all that stuff. It's more about us thinking about how much we want to commit, how much do we really believe that a more informed, educated, activated, engaged patient is a better patient. If we really fundamentally believe that, we've got to hardwire it in, we can do the technology as well. But your influence in the very first touch is the paramount thing, you know, um, that we've seen in the, in, the, in the data. So in some of our uh, organizations, St. Elizabeth's out in Kentucky, they're a big epic shop as well. So we're in four hospitals there, about 1,200, 1,400 beds. And um, they have some of the country's highest utilization on education. And when you walk in, they're actually using uh, a digital whiteboard. And their first touch with the patient, they're actually forming goals with the patient for their stay and putting them up on the screen as part of intake, right? So, like, and so, so for them, they've kind of hardwired, hey, we're going to get these people involved right away. You know, so there's things that we are seeing that have really worked well um, that we just need to work a bit with you guys as well if that's an interest. So anyway, but a really important point. <clears throat> Any other questions in the room? I guess for either of you, uh, any idea on a timeline when uh, PEI scores may be used in, in this hospital? Were you hiding the data or what? <laughs> it's <hiding> tomorrow. <laughs> now, um, the data is being reviewed from the adult inpatient pilot right now. So we want to see what kind of information we got out of it. Our real goal is we're going to move to PEI. We're going to, we're going to make PEI happen. We have to decide the methodology we're going to use. Is it a one-shot survey? We need you to answer all the questions at once. Do we break it up? What is the most effective way to actually get people to complete the survey, not get halfway through it? So we're reviewing. We had four units for 30 days that we, we, we did this with. So I would say probably within this fiscal year we'll get the EI up. And we have to work with the EPIC side on integration. How do we get that number in place that's visible to you all? Because that was been my big bone of contention is I don't want providers having to go to a separate system to pull this up to see the number. It has to be up front. So one thing on this, and one of the places in the research, they're doing something where if the EHRs uh, continue to be a pain in the ass and this kind of stuff, like we really don't care. For us, it's about like how can we help make visible this indication to help the providers and the patients out. So if, if that takes a long time on the ethics side, imagine it's just on the patient screen. So I'm walking in to talk to a patient, and literally on their screen, is their score and is telling them. So that might actually also help them to say, hey, listen, you're at a 67 and your practice is actually really low. Can we help you be more proactive? You should go check these things out. So th this is the kind, this is what the research is telling us is if we just get more explicit and intentional 
with involving people in, they actually dive in. And so in one of our research plates, they're actually putting the score up on the screen for the patient families themselves and educating them on what this actually means to them. So there's just different things that we're trying to figure out. Um, the outcome, this is too early to understand, does it really impact the outcome to the care yet, you know? Um, but the scores we think can make very visible and should be visible to the patient and family, not just to provide them as well. Okay. I'm going to unmute the phones here real fast just in case we have somebody on the line who has a question. Uh, if you do not have a question and you are listening, please put your phone on mute right now so that we don't hear you. The conference is now in talk mode. Anyone on the line have a question? Then I'll get to Dr. J. Joe. Anyone on the line at all? Oh. <laughs> no? Okay. You guys just put your phone on mute so we don't hear what's going on. I'll get to Dr. J. Joe. Hi there. I'm primarily outpatient, and so it, um, I was just kind of thinking about this, what this would mean for our patients, especially our little ones, when dad brings them to one visit and grandma brings them to the next and mom brings them to the next, where they all may have different PEI scores, and if that would be addressed in any way. Yeah, so the PEI is a great question. So the PEI was developed um, for adults initially um, and is being modified and we're trying to figure this out for kids. And as part of the kid PEI, um, the caregivers and family are a big part of this figuring out. So we don't have that figured out yet. Um, and we'll take some time to figure it out. And we'll have to, again, be done not through our opinion, but through the actual research of what actually is creating a, valid, a reliable score, if you will. Um, and that's the next phase of the PEI research, actually, is on the PEI side. We'd love you guys involved if you're interested. So. I was going to say, sounds like you're signing up to... I know, I was going to say. So, so just so you know, so, but, but on that, just so you know, so uh, Stanford is involved in this research, as is Boston um, uh, Children's and two others I can't, Nationwide, I think, as well. So um, it's a big piece of, big body of work the next probably 12 to 18 months. So. Okay. Any other questions in the room or on the line? All right. I hope we did not bore your tears. Thank you so no. much for letting us spend some time with you all today. Have a great, great day. Thank you. Thank you. If you're still on the line uh, and you could not ask your question, you can always email me at outreach at and I can get them to our presenter. Oh, thank you. We appreciate you joining us this morning. And with that, we're going to go ahead and disconnect the phone lines now. Thank you all very much.